NASCAR really isn't that much different from any other sport. The rules are pretty simple. Complete the designated number of laps before anybody else. Throw the ball into the goal. Kick the ball into the goal. Hit the ball with a stick and run around the bases. It's pretty simple. Sometimes you wonder why we even need officials at all. But of course, when you're playing on this high level, well, somebody has to enforce the rules. And the people enforcing the rules, well, they're just like you and me. They're human beings. They make mistakes. And unfortunately, the outcome of an event can be determined by one bad call. Or, in some cases, a series of bad calls. In this respect, NASCAR is no different. So without further ado, let's get started. Number 10, the 2007 LifeLock 400 at Kansas Speedway. This 2007 race at Kansas Speedway was in the chase that year, so you know tensions were high to begin with. Add that to rain in the area, and well, you had a, just a terrible race to deal with. Now the controversy could have been here that NASCAR tried to shorten the race down to 225 laps, and then bad cautions started coming out, and they tried to shorten it again to 210 laps, and now everybody's pissed off because nobody knows when the race is supposed to end. But the real controversy here is how the race ended once NASCAR decided it was going to be all over. After a long red flag for track drying procedures, finally we get back underway. We have darkness falling, track doesn't have lights, and Greg Biffle has been trying to save fuel for a long time now. It seems like he's got enough to make it. He comes off of turn four, the yellow and checkers are waving as darkness begins to fall and everybody's leaving the track already, and then his car loses power. Clint Boyer in second place starts to slow down as Greg Biffle slows down, and Jimmy Johnson passes both of them. Now Clint Boyer after Afterwards would catch up to Jimmy Johnson and pass him, thinking that he had won this. The rules state that under yellow flag conditions, your car has to be under its own power, not being pushed, and maintain pace car speed. Greg Biffle not only coasts to the finish, but he has two cars eventually pass him. He was clearly out of gas. He just pulls it off in the infield and just parks it in the grass when he's done. You would think, well, yeah, Clint Boyer probably won. He was still under his own power. He stopped and slowed down because Biffle was slowing down and he was in his way and he still had gas there at the end. But no, NASCAR says, fuck it, Greg Biffle's the winner, we're getting out of here. They deny all the protests. I get it, it had been a long day, NASCAR was frustrated, the rain, the darkness setting in, this is a playoff race, you get a lot of eyes on you, but at the same time, you just want to get the fuck out of there. But let's examine all the other times where a guy who ran out of fuel or his car stopped under yellow flag conditions and he was thus penalized or moved back to wherever he got his car restarted at. Marcus Ambrose at Sonoma, trying to save fuel, shuts his car off, tries to coast up the hill, doesn't quite make it, eventually, finally gets his car restarted, and ends up as the last car on the lead lap. Justin Allgaier at Road America, runs out of gas, was leading the race, gets put all the way to the back. NASCAR is usually pretty consistent on this, and it was very clear Greg Biffle was out of gas when he came out of turn four, and he had cars pass him, but I just don't think NASCAR wanted to piss people off in the stands who were still there, who had stayed to watch the whole race. They didn't want this playoff race to be a source of controversy about who won and who didn't. They didn't want to take a win away from a guy who had just won, and then people get home later that day and find out that guy actually didn't win. They changed it after they left. Plus, they were tired of this race. It had gone well past its scheduled time. But even still, it doesn't excuse this. And by the way, if you think that's the last time a scoring controversy is going to pop up on this list, you're dead wrong. Speaking of scoring controversies, number 9, the 1990 First Union 400 at North Wilkesboro Speedway. Okay, so NASCAR did not implement electronic timing and scoring until 1993. This means NASCAR had officials keep track of the position of every single car on the track. They would all compare notes, and if they all agreed on something, hopefully, those would be the final results. Well, at the First Union 400 at North Wilkesboro in 1990, there was a big kerfuffle. Let's go ahead and give you the rundown. Okay, so it's a 400 lap race. Pretty long race at a track that's a little over half a mile long. But unlike most short track races, this one goes green for a very, very long time. There's only a handful of cars still in the lead lap, about 10 or so. Brett Bodine is driving around in his number 26 car and decides to short pit. That means he basically didn't go all the way until the end of his fuel run and hoping a caution would come out and he would be able to have fresher tires than everybody else. He finishes up his pit stop with not much of an issue. He goes back out on the track, a few more laps wind down, and then Kenny Wallace, good old Kenny Wallace, spins out. 
bringing out a caution. The pace car goes out and picks up Dale Earnhardt as the leader of the race. However, Brett Bodine's wife is kicking the back of Larry McReynolds' chair, his crew chief at the time, saying, no, according to my notes, we are currently the leader. After the whole pit cycle got done, Brett Bodine was the leader, according to his team. And even some NASCAR officials still have the 26 car as the leader. Something like 17 laps of caution goes by before NASCAR finally throws up its hands and says, all right, Brett Bodine is the leader, just let him out in front. The race finally restarts, Brett Bodine keeps his dominant track position and eventually goes on to win the race, which, fun fact, is the last time Buick won a race in NASCAR, and immediately, Darrell Waltrip protests the finish. He appeals to NASCAR president and CEO, Bill France Jr., and says, you know Brett Bodine did not win this race. And rather oddly, Bill France Jr. says something that suggests, yeah, he knew there was a scoring error, but he did nothing to change it. He simply didn't care. I walk over to Bill and I'm almost on my knees. I'm saying, Bill, he did not win this race. And everybody in this garage area knows that. And Mr. France, in his divine wisdom, took his cigarette out of his mouth, put his arm around me, and he said, DW, leave that boy alone. That's the first race he's ever won, and you're going to win a lot more races. As much as I appreciated Mr. France feeling that way, it turned out that 1990, that was the first year I didn't win a race. So here you have Brett Bodine winning his only NASCAR race ever, basically because the CEO and president of NASCAR knew there was a scoring error and just said, eh, fuck it, it makes for a good story. But oh, 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 man. Speaking of good stories, number eight, the 2007 Montreal race in Montreal, Canada. In 2007, for the Napa Auto Parts 200, for the first time, NASCAR ventures north of the border. The race itself is good. It's a nice sunny day in the middle of summer. It's a perfectly fine race. No real controversies until we get to the ass end of the race. On a late restart, there is a big pileup in the first series of turns. In first place is the 59 car of Marcus Ambrose, and in second place is the 55 of Robbie Gordon. They are well ahead when this whole parking lot happens in turns one and two. However, just before the caution comes, Comes out as it looks like Robbie Gordon makes a pass on Marcus Ambrose and then in the next turn immediately after that Marcus Ambrose turns and spins out Robbie Gordon while under caution now you can make an argument here that Marcus Ambrose didn't know there was a caution out he didn't see the flagman it was just beating and banging whatever now when caution comes out immediately the field is frozen if you were running at regular race speed and you were not involved in an accident then you maintain your position at the time of caution. So you could make an argument that Robbie Gordon was out front at the time of caution or he was in second and Marcus Ambrose was in front, uh, whatever. But NASCAR does something very, very odd. They say, no, Robbie Gordon did not maintain race speed at the time of caution, to which I would say, yeah, he was busy being spun out on purpose by Marcus Ambrose. I mean, you can clearly see they have their back bumpers all torn up. They had been going at it for a while. They were not fans of each other that day. NASCAR says, Robbie Gordon has to be placed in the 12th position on the restart, to which Robbie Gordon says, uh, no thanks, I'll just sit right here in second. Seriously, he just stayed there in the second position all the way up until the restart, and crazily, NASCAR throws the green flag. You have a guy who's clearly pissed off at the guy in front of him, saying, no, I'm not going to go where you place me, I'm going to sit right here behind him. And then what happens going into the first series of turns on the restart? Well, he dumps Marcus Ambrose. Robbie Gordon just drives off into the sunset, and then NASCAR says, yeah, he's not being scored anymore, meaning it's as though he never even attended the race. Why NASCAR would let this happen? Clearly, this had disaster written all over it. It just boggles my mind. Eventually, Kevin Harvick wins the race, and then him and Robbie Gordon, rather bewilderingly, do twin burnouts down the front straight. I guess the fans like that. I mean, that would have been pretty cool to see, but it must have been really confusing if you were a guy out in the stands and you didn't have a radio scanner wondering, well, who actually won this race? What happened to Marcos? Why was Robbie Gordon no longer on the uh, scoring pylon? What the fuck happened? NASCAR eventually suspends Robbie Gordon from his cup race the next day and says, uh, yeah, you owe us a lot of money. He gets fined and eventually goes and keeps racing in NASCAR. But man, this race, (laughs) I don't know how the hell NASCAR decided they were going to handle it the way they did. It was just mind-bogglingly stupid. Speaking of mind-bogglingly stupid, how about this one? The 2014 Daytona 500 
500, Casey Kane gets penalized for avoiding an accident. Yeah, this is about as stupid as it fucking sounds. Okay, let's give you the rundown. Green flag pit stops are going on. A group of cars comes down on the pit road, but Michael Annette behind Casey Kane loses it. He's out of control. He's not slowing down. He's just barreling towards him. Seeing this car coming in his rear view mirror and likely his spotter saying, gas it, gas it, gas it. There's a guy coming in way too hot behind you. Casey Kane gooses the throttle, takes off, and just barely misses Michael Annette. No caution comes out. Race remains green. Casey Kane does his pit stop and takes off. Later, he gets penalized by NASCAR. The charge? Too fast entering pit lane, but not too fast exiting. Casey Kane and his crew protest, yeah, we're avoiding an accident. Historically, NASCAR has always been very lenient when it comes to enforcing uh, pit road speeding penalties if you are avoiding an accident. The rule has always been, if you're avoiding an accident and you go onto pit road, as long as you make, quote, an honest attempt to reduce your speed, you're good. For example, the 2007 Daytona 500, same track, same race. Here you see Dave Blaney diving onto pit road to avoid an accident and get his car back under him, and then he merges back onto traffic. He ends up causing an accident, but there's no penalty. 2001, Las Vegas, Sterling Marlin spins out on the entrance of pit road. NASCAR realizes, yeah, way too fast entering, but we're not going to enforce that because you weren't under your own power. You were out of control. That would be, quote, an overly harsh penalty. And yet, here is Casey Kane making a green flag pit stop all by his lonesome, no draft help, gooses the throttle just a little bit to avoid an accident, does his pit stop, and then leaves the pit lane and gets a penalty anyway. Bear in mind, he only got bopped for too fast entering, not too fast exiting. He maintained his pit road speed in all of the pit road segments after this. NASCAR tries to throw up the flimsy excuse that it's a computerized system and it's all automated. Yeah, but NASCAR, you control the timing and scoring. You can just say, yeah, we're not going to allow that. That penalty is lifted. NASCAR, for whatever reason, just doubles down and triples down and says, yeah, we're just going to penalize you for avoiding an accident. Fuck it. So let's go ahead and get to number six on this list. You know, we haven't seen yet a good old fashioned yellow line controversy. Number six, Regan Smith snubbed up his first win. It's the 2008 fall Talladega race and Regan Smith is filling in for Mark Martin, who's running a part-time schedule this year. It's a fairly normal Talladega race. You've got the big one. You've got a lot of single file racing going on as guys just try to wind down the laps and try to make one last push to get the win. And then coming into the trioval on the last lap, about half a mile to go, Regan Smith fakes high and then dives low. He gets right underneath Tony Stewart and then Tony Stewart touches him and he gets bopped below the yellow line. Regan Smith blends back into traffic and then, I don't know if anybody knows this, it doesn't get said enough, but that trioval is five lanes wide. Going into the front stretch out of the trioval, it bottlenecks into four lanes. So when Regan Smith merges back into traffic, he's up underneath Tony Stewart. As that yellow line creeps up towards him to get rid of that fifth bottom lane, he's again forced below it. Tony Stewart's not getting out of his way. Regan Smith crosses the line first. NASCAR says, no way, Jose. You went below the yellow line. Regan Smith's crew says, yeah, we were forced. Did you not see Tony Stewart just block us and actually touch our car and force us below the yellow line? Also, we made an honest attempt to get back back into traffic. NASCAR says, nope, rules are rules. But here's a compilation of all the times NASCAR said, yeah, the yellow line rule no longer applies. Some wonder if Sunday's result would have been the same if it were Dale Jr. past the leader below the yellow line. Here comes Jr. He's got to run. Kids are trying to oh, close him oh, off. Oh, 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 it's going to be borderline, guys. Boy, I don't know. That was a pass under the line. I don't know what we're going to see here. It would be very unpopular to black flag him. But as he turns left and comes out of the pack, the momentum takes him all the way that far. Okay, you now see the, him coming the out 11 didn't go below the yellow line. There would have been some contact there, but I didn't. I don't know. <laughs> You're not going to go there? No, I'm not going there. Don't you, don't, uh, On the final lap of the truck race, check out Austin Dillon here in the back. That's your points leader going below the yellow line to advance his position. And if that wasn't obvious enough, come into the checkers off of turn four. He puts all friggin' four wheels, tires, they're below the yellow line and picks up another couple spots. Yeah, this one's like pretty cut and dry. I mean, that is clearly a block. That is clearly being forced below the yellow line. Yet NASCAR's like, nope, it's fine, it's cool, whatever. They deny all the protests again, pack up their stuff, and go home. However, just a few years later, Regan Smith would eventually get his first NASCAR win, and Mike Joy would have this to say about it. Smith gets the flag, and this time he'll get to keep it. Nice little jab there, Mike. I like that. All right, for number five, how about we go after some NASCAR royalty? 
The King Richard Petty probably did not win 200 races. Okay, the first part of this is going to be a bit speculative. You got 200 races won across Richard Petty's career, all of them before electronic timing and scoring, which means there had to have been some scoring errors in there at some point. Richard Petty had a lot of protests against him, more than any other race car driver ever, which comes naturally. I mean, he won more than anybody ever. Do you think NASCAR got every single one of those right? I mean, yeah, he did have some wins taken away because of scoring errors getting fixed, but he definitely got the benefit of the doubt because he's King Richard Petty. Even in the 60s and 70s, people were already calling him King Richard I. But again, that's entirely speculative. I cannot put that on this list, right? Well, how about in 1983, at the Fall Charlotte race, Richard Petty winning his 198th career win, two away from 200. Except, in post-race tech inspection, NASCAR found out this. He had an engine that was an unbelievable 24 cubic inches too big, and left side tires all the way around the car. You're supposed to have certain tires on the left side that can only be on the left side, and certain tires that can only be on the right. Side. If there are two things NASCAR hates more than anything, it is messing with the engine and messing with the tires. I mean, hell, in 2009, Carl Long got suspended for 12 months and fined nearly a quarter of a million dollars for having an engine that was 0.17 cubic inches too big. And he said that was an honest mistake. He had bought it from Ganassi. Now, NASCAR does fine Richard Petty quite a bit of money and dock him a hundred and some odd points, but they let the win stand. Why? Because he's King Richard I, and he's almost at 200, and this is going to be the biggest NASCAR story ever. And just as luck would have it, in the summer of 1984, at the Firecracker 400, Richard Petty wins his 200th race with Ronald Reagan flying in on Air Force One to the Daytona International Airport right behind him as the backdrop. It's a perfect story, and it was almost entirely manufactured. Again, being royalty comes with its privileges, I guess. Okay, enough with NASCAR giving the benefit of the doubt to royalty. How about NASCAR just having it out for one guy? No matter what, they want to screw him at every point. Carl Edwards has been on the short end of the stick of just about every single decision ever made by NASCAR. He has never had anything go his way. I swear, if he was still racing today, he'd be the Mark Martin of the modern era. But I don't think he ever got screwed over quite as bad as the 2006 Bud Shootout. It's a nice, bright, sunny day. We're running the Bud Shootout on Sunday afternoon because the Winter Olympics are happening, much like this year, and Carl Edwards goes into the 2006 season as the favorite to win the championship. In 2005, he won four races and did really, really well in the points. I mean, hell, Roush Fenway Racing, his team, has the frickin' dream team, man. Of the last three NASCAR champions, we got two of them on our team, Matt Kenseth and Kurt Busch. We have Greg Biffle, who just lit up the charts, winning everything on the big tracks last year. You got Mark Martin, the savvy veteran, 35 career wins, four championship runner-ups to his credit. He is a legend, arguably the best NASCAR driver to never win a championship. And then you have the rising star, Carl Edwards. In 2005, all five Roush drivers made the chase that year. And keep in mind, the chase field was just 10 drivers, half of them. Half were Roush Racing drivers. That's insane. But going into 2006, we've hit some turbulence. Mark Martin said he was going to retire and then signs a one-year deal with Jack Roush to keep driving the number six car while he finds a replacement. Kurt Busch leaves and goes and joins Penske. Jamie McMurray, who has only one career win, which is a total Cinderella story, comes and takes over the number 26 car, which is Kurt Busch's old team. The Bud Shootout kicks off the 2006 season, and it's a fairly standard race. You got J.J. Yaley, Clint Boyer, up in there, Denny Hamlin, all three of those guys in their first season ever in the Cup Series. Coming out of turn four, there's a big accident. Cars are slipping and sliding everywhere. Carl Edwards goes really low to duck, avoids all the cars, gets back up onto the track, and tries to catch up with the draft. But NASCAR bops him for something. They say, hey, you pass cars below the yellow line. You're not allowed to advance your position. Carl Edwards and his team say, we didn't advance our position. We net lost positions. What are you talking about? NASCAR says, no, those cars cars back there that were out of control sliding around all over the track, you passed them while you were below the yellow line. Carl Edwards says, what? 
Are you serious right now? I was avoiding an accident. Carl Edwards says, and I quote, No, I'm not doing it. It's wrong. I'm not coming in to serve my penalty. Carl Edwards' crew chief eventually calms him down and says, You gotta serve the penalty. Just come down the pit road and do this pass-through penalty. It'll be fine. Carl Edwards finally says, All right, I'll do the penalty. And then he gets bopped for speeding. Carl Edwards loses it and just goes and parks the car. He's done with it. It's a non-points race. It's just for money. There's no point in doing this anymore. That's bad enough, right? But the 2006 season for Carl Edwards is absolutely abysmal. He doesn't win a race. He doesn't even make the chase. NASCAR ruined Carl Edwards' 2006 season. And people wonder why he retired so early. His heart probably just couldn't take anymore. Okay, so NASCAR basically single-handedly ruined a driver's sophomore season where he was the favorite to win the championship. That's bad enough, right? Well, how about snubbing a driver of his first win ever because of his race. Yeah, let's talk about race relations. That's a hot topic right now. You know, cheery stuff. Number three, Wendell Scott snubbed of the win at the Jacksonville 200 in 1963 to avoid a race riot. All right, let's go ahead and give you the setup. Wendell Scott is an African-American race car driver from Virginia competing in NASCAR's Cup Series at the time called the Grand National Division. Wendell Scott doesn't have a whole lot of money. He doesn't have any sponsors. Everything he has, he has bought or built himself from the ground up. NASCAR and pretty much all of the drivers have a massive amount of respect for Wendell Scott and what he's able to do. When he won at Jacksonville in 1963, it was the feel-good story in the garage. However, Wendell Scott was not that beloved by NASCAR fans. I mean, hey, it's the South in the 1960s. How do you think he was treated? And when Wendell Scott takes the checkered flag at the end of 200 laps at the Jacksonville Fairgrounds, NASCAR basically invents a scoring error, quote-unquote, to give the win to somebody else. Because NASCAR was quite understandably afraid of what would happen if a black NASCAR driver was kissing the white trophy girl at the end of the race. So they gave the win to some white guy, he got the trophy, he got the girl, he got the check, which was eventually rescinded, and then at the end of the day, when everybody has left the fairgrounds, NASCAR comes up to Wendell Scott and says, you won the race, congratulations, here's your check. They eventually mail him his trophy after the other guy took off with it, although the second trophy they gave him was much smaller. Yeah, it's a really really shitty thing to do, but NASCAR kind of had their hands tied. I mean, NASCAR fans are not exactly the most open and accepting bunch. I mean, just really sports fans in general. I mean, have you seen the Boston Bruins fans when there's a black hockey player out on the rink? Oh, it's terrible. Sports fans are the worst sometimes, and this is basically the worst of the worst NASCAR has to offer. Racist fans being assholes and NASCAR basically having to invent a scoring error so that nobody loses their shit. To be fair, NASCAR NASCAR did this mostly for Wendell Scott's safety. I mean, it sucks for him, but man, back in 1963, that would have been a dangerous situation down in Jacksonville, Florida. Okay, let's move on to more lighthearted fare. How about union busting? That's popular, right? Especially in this economy. Number two, the 1969 Talladega 500. Okay, so this is the very first race at Talladega Super Speedway. This is the money race. Bill France essentially went bankrupt trying to build this track. Everything hinged on it. And then as the drivers come in on Wednesday before race weekend to practice, something comes up. At the time, NASCAR had two tire manufacturers, Goodyear and Firestone, and both companies could not find a compound that would hold up at the high speeds. These guys are running about 190 miles an hour. That's 100 190 miles an hour in 1969. Guys are running as few as like four or five laps and the tires are just shredded. There is a big controversy here of is there going to be a tire that's going to be able to hold up? What do we do come Sunday if we don't have anything? And then Firestone steps up and says we're pulling out, leaving only Goodyear to supply tires for the race. And Goodyear still can't find a compound that works. Now, for a while now, the PDA, the Professional Drivers Association, which is a sort of union organization. They never called themselves a union, but it was basically a union. They're talking about pensions, they're talking about uh, driver insurance programs and stuff, about having a a fixed starting salary, you know, everything that a union would fight for, that's what the PDA does. The president of the PDA, none other than Richard Petty. They also have every other driver that's worth mentioning under their wing. Got Bobby Allison, Don 
Donny Allison, the whole Alabama gang's there, Richard Petty, David Pearson, basically everybody except Bobby Isaac. Of course, Bobby Isaac was always kind of a loner. He, he's a really interesting guy if you ever read up on him. But Bobby Isaac basically says, mm, not going to join the PDA. So they basically have everybody except him. And Bill France doesn't even acknowledge that the PDA exists. Journalists try to come up to him, newspaper reporters try to come up to him and ask him, well, what do you think about the PDA? I mean, they're starting to get some traction here. We don't know if this race is going to happen. What do you think about what the PDA is doing? And Bill French would basically say, I don't know what you're talking about. All I know is there's a bunch of drivers that I have who are scared to race. And according to Bobby Allison, uh, Leroy Yarbrough took a swing at Bill France. Uh, Richard Petty says he didn't make contact. Uh, Bobby Allison says he made contact and put him down on the ground. Uh, so, uh, th- of course, anytime you're talking about unions getting involved in something, there always tends to be like some fisticuffs that break out. I mean, you're talking about people's jobs here, and these guys' jobs, I mean, back in the 1960s, people were dying on a semi-regular basis at these races. I mean, it was still relatively rare, but it wasn't terribly uncommon. And if you got tires that are shredding and falling apart after four laps of use at the biggest, baddest track on the circuit going 190 miles an hour, you're like, yeah, I can't do that. And so one by one, all the drivers in the PDA pack up their stuff and they leave. This leaves Dodge, the manufacturer, in a tricky situation because they were going to debut the Dodge Charger Daytona, the big winged Superbird, here at this track. It was a car that supposedly could go 200 miles an hour, and later, uh, about a year later, Buddy Baker would make it do that infamous uh, 200.447 mile an hour lap. So Dodge, all of a sudden, has basically just Bobby Isaac to drive their car, and his teammate, essentially, Richard Brickhouse. Only problem is Richard Brickhouse is a member of the PDA. One of the guys at Dodge comes up to him and basically says, look, this car is going to run. If you don't do it, somebody else will. And Richard Brickhouse resigns from the PDA and goes and and runs the race. So that leaves three cup drivers racing. Bobby Isaac, Richard Brickhouse, and Jim Vandiver. Jim Vandiver is actually filling in for a PDA driver, and he's running the old model of Dodge. He has no factory support. Of course, you can't run a NASCAR race for 500 miles at this big 2.66 mile track, the biggest, baddest, fastest track opening weekend with just three dudes. Can't do it. So Bill France steps in and says, uh, yeah, all the guys from the preliminary race uh, yesterday, the sportsman race, you guys all get to race today. Now the sportsman division has these pony cars, just some Camaros, stuff like that. There's one AMC Javelin, which is kind of weird, but all these guys get folded over into the main race. He just changes the rules. He's like, yeah, you guys have these cars that are too small. The wheelbase is too narrow. Uh, The engines are too small. The body types aren't right. Uh, Some of the manufacturers aren't even in our sport anymore. But uh, yeah, you guys can run. Yeah, you guys all conform to the rules now. We'll change tech inspection later. Just just, just get in there. He essentially just changes the rules at will and just says, yeah, all these guys from yesterday, they get to race here today because I just need a full field. And some of these guys are doing like 140, 150 miles an hour. Meanwhile, you have Jim Vandiver... Richard Brickhouse and Bobby Isaac out there running 190. Bobby Isaac ends up having that same tire issue we were talking about earlier, and he fades back into the field. He just says, "Eh, I'm just going to take my paycheck and go home. No need to do anything crazy here. I'm going to get all these points anyway, and these guys that all left aren't going to get any points, so I'm going to make a run at this championship. No need to put my life on the line or anything. And meanwhile, Richard Brickhouse and Jim Vandiver are racing for their first win. And of course, there has to be a timing and scoring contract. Controversy. To this day, Jim Vandiver and his team contend that they were ahead of Richard Brickhouse. And even in the radio commentary, the people in the booth didn't know who was ahead. Eventually, NASCAR just says, yeah, Richard Brickhouse was ahead. And some people say, well, there might have been some politics involved. You know, he was a factory-backed team, and maybe the Dodge Corporation was talking to NASCAR officials. I mean, they were up in the same suite in the same booth. So they might have been saying, hey, can you put Richard Brickhouse ahead? That would look really great for our uh, Dodge Charger. Daytona that we just brought here, you know, we kind of helped you with this whole thing, so you could do us a solid here, right? Did that happen? I haven't seen any information one way or the other. It wouldn't surprise me with as crazy as this thing has been, but 
the race ends, Richard Brickhouse is declared the winner, and just the next week over, he gets spun out by former PDA drivers. And the PDA is no more. The union is busted. Talladega is now the biggest, best track on the NASCAR circuit, raking in well over 100,000 attendees every single race day. It is, by all measures, against all odds, a success, but still, that's some shady shit to do. Busting up a union, having drivers drive in unsafe conditions, changing the rules to allow cars that are not in any way cup rated to race at a much slower speed, and then the timing and scoring controversy, yeah, this solidly takes its place as number two on this list. So what could be worse than this? What could take the number one slot? Well, how about NASCAR penalizing the one mainstay of NASCAR racing, the hallmark of NASCAR racing, the classic bump and run? Number one, the 1991 race at Sears Point. Okay, last lap. Davy Allison is ahead. Ricky Rudd driving a Hendrick car right behind him, hot on his trail. They go into one of the turns and, oh man, Ricky Rudd spins out Davy Allison. How could this have happened? Oh man, Davy Allison's going to be mad about that. He's going to get him at the next race. But oh well, Rubbin's racing. He dumped them. That happens every once in a while. And Ricky Rudd comes across the last corner and gets black flagged. What the hell? In a move that has never been repeated before or since, NASCAR penalizes Ricky Rudd with one lap for dumping Davy Allison. Now I have no doubt in my mind that this is largely because Davy Allison was the son of royalty. He was a son of Bobby Allison. He was arguably the next big rising star. And had he not died in that helicopter crash in 1993, he probably would have been bigger than Jeff Gordon. I mean, how many wins would Davy Allison had stolen away from Jeff Gordon, Jimmy Johnson, whoever, if he was still racing today? But back in 1991, he was up against Ricky Rudd, and Ricky Rudd either intentionally or unintentionally bumped him going into one of the turns and spun him out. Davy Allison gathers the car back up, ends up finishing second, and then Ricky Rudd gets black flagged and becomes the race winner. Ricky Rudd's crew is absolutely livid. And of course, this is the era of ESPN, flag to flag, live broadcast, every race. So they're capturing all of this. I mean, it's absolutely unconscionable that NASCAR would do this. I mean, look at this race. Kyle Busch and Kyle Larson coming to the checkered at Bristol. Kyle Busch basically puts a block on Larson, runs him up into the wall. No penalty. Here's Dale Earnhardt wrecking Terry Labonte in 1995 at Bristol. Terry Labonte still comes up ahead, but Dale Earnhardt doesn't get penalized. In 1999, also at Bristol, here's Dale Earnhardt finishing the job. Last lap spins out Terry Labonte. Doesn't even bump him out of the way, just blatantly spins him out. Again, no penalty. Here's Robbie Gordon and Kurt Busch going in through the grass, basically cutting the bus stop at Watkins Glen in half. Somehow Kurt Busch holds on to it, but no penalty. Kyle Busch and Dale Earnhardt Jr. at Richmond. Kyle Busch spins Dale Earnhardt Jr. out. No penalty. Why does NASCAR not penalize this? Because it's usually a self-policing problem. If you spin somebody out who's ahead of you on the last lap, well, guess what they're going to do the next time they're behind you? They're going to spin you out. And they're going to say, hey, he wants to race me that way? I'll race him that way. NASCAR has always treated this with a sort of boys have at it attitude. But not here in 1991 when their golden boy got booted by Ricky Rudd. I have to agree with Ricky Rudd's crew chief. That's the derndest thing I've ever seen. You know, I don't understand this. You know, I've been racing since 63, and this is about one of the darndest calls I've seen made in a long time. 